I think we can all agree that planned obsolescence is infuriating. Something deliberately designed to break down after a few years of service requiring you to replace it. But have you ever seen the opposite? Where something intended to be disposable has kept going well past its service life? Because in the case of the S160s, that's exactly what happened. As the Second World War was heating up, the United States were trying their best to remain neutral while providing aid to the Allied forces. A deal was made to provide Britain with 200 S-159 class locomotives for use in the Middle East as well as additional aid, but that soon changed once the US officially joined the war in December 1941. To help with efforts in Europe, Major MJ Marsh designed a locomotive for use on European railways, using aspects of the S-159 while keeping it within Britain's very restrictive loading gauge. The end result was a 280 tender engine that was powerful, cheap to build, could be easily converted to burn oil, the tenders were designed to make them easier to run in reverse, and were relatively straightforward to modify to meet the needs of whatever railway they ran on. Pleased with the design, the United States Army Transportation Corps ordered Baldwin, Lima, and Alco to start building. Classified as S-160s, the first batch arrived in Britain in 1942. They were meant to be kept in storage for later deployment into mainland Europe, but 400 of them ended up being pressed into service by the LMS, LNER, Great Western, and Southern Railways to keep up with demand and fill in for damaged locomotives, with another batch of 400 arriving and being put into storage. Some modifications had to be made to help improve the locomotive's compatibility with Britain's railways, such as trimming 9.5mm off the inside of the wheel's flanges. The alterations to the wheels did help provide a smoother ride, however the flanges were still thin compared to those on British engines, often causing the S160s to pick points and derail. And the wheels weren't the only issue. Thanks to all the corners cut to make the engines fast and cheap to build, their axle box lubricators were substandard, often leading to axle boxes running hot if not frequently maintained. Another issue was their controls. Not only did drivers have a hard time initially learning the American layout, but the position of the brake cylinder made braking very difficult. Worse still was the firebox. The stay bolts were found to easily fatigue, and because of the quick turnaround times needed thanks to the war, boiler washouts weren't always done properly, causing a buildup of scale around the firebox crown, further weakening it. Complicating matters even more was the water gauge in the cab. British crews were unfamiliar with the American Klinger design that required both cocks be opened slowly to get an accurate reading. If done incorrectly, the water would be trapped in the gauge and show a false reading, showing the water level to be fine when in reality it was dangerously low. If the water got too low, the crown sheet would overheat, causing the stay bolts to fail, resulting in a sudden boiler explosion. Between November of 1943 and August 1944, there were three S-160s that suffered firebox crown collapses, resulting in one fireman losing his life. On top of that, compared to the austerity engines already in use in Britain, both the Stania 8F and Riddles' 280 austerity, the S-160s were slightly heavier, slightly less powerful, and much more awkward for crews to handle. What the S-160s lacked in grace, however, they more than made up for with numbers. A total of 2,120 of these engines were built, outnumbering both the 8Fs and austerities combined. In 1944, following D-Day, the rest of the S-160s were shipped to mainland Europe and Africa, along with the 400 stored in Britain. The other 400 that had been used on British rails were repaired and dispatched shortly afterwards. Once deployed, the S-160s found themselves all over the world. In Europe, working on nearly every railway from Spain to the Soviet Union. In Africa, they operated around Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria, with most of them eventually moving to Italy. And in Asia, they worked in India, China, and both North and South Korea. Some engines were specially built in the US with wider axles to run on the broad gauge lines of Russia and India. 
Many footplate crews had teething problems with the engines just like in Britain, but this was understandable given the S160s were built as temporary motive power and weren't tailored to every railway. After the war was over, the engines remained in Europe to help rebuild until 1946, when the US ATC began the process of disposing of them as they'd fulfilled their purpose. Some were just cut up for scrap and parts, however, many European railways were in dire need of motive power, and ended up buying many S-160s to keep them going while they rebuilt. Many settled into a new life working in Poland, Italy, Turkey, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia. Hungary took the most units, 510 in total, though these had to be extensively modified to make them more compatible with Hungarian railways, such as having new brakes fitted, new whistles, taller chimneys, and having their cabs and tenders raised. Despite being built primarily for freight work, in Hungary they were mostly used as passenger engines. A handful of engines deployed in Spain ended up in Alaska, but the ones spread over Asia perhaps saw the most use. They continued to work in India well into the late 1970s, and most S-160s working in China didn't retire until the 1990s. Impressive considering they were only built to last a few years at best. Out of the 2,120 built, 33 still exist to this day in one form or another. Six survive in Greece, two in Italy, two in Turkey, three in Poland, three in Hungary with the fourth being just a boiler, six in the UK with an additional two being stripped for spares, and eight managed to make their way back home to the US on display at various museums across the country. The S-160s then certainly stand out among many other engines in preservation, not only because of their American style contrasting with many of the European designs they're often displayed alongside, but the fact they lasted so long on railways they weren't 100% equipped to operate on while being built to be disposable. Let this be a reminder then that, even if something isn't built to last, that doesn't mean it can't do great things. Subscribe for more.